Today, I'm gonna to show you how I make perfect cuts with a mid-grade table saw. Now, before we get started, you'll notice that my table saw does not have a riving knife. This model was a year behind the standardization of riving knives. If your saw has one, they'll increase not only your accuracy, but your safety. If I were to ever upgrade my table saw, it would be for this one feature alone. But again, I'm gonna show you how I make perfect cuts even without the riving knife. Most table saws have a little measuring strip down here on the edge of the table. For the longest time, I used to rely on this and this alone to get cuts. Because of this, I ended up with a lot of errors as different blade thicknesses forced me to move this pin. To illustrate this, I've got three different blades here. This is a 16th of an inch, this is 3 30 seconds of an inch, and this is an eighth of an inch. While I'm not gonna go into the reasons why I use each one in this video, I will quickly show you what happens when I use each one of these blades and I don't move the pin. If we look at this, my fence is over here. I've got my eighth inch cut, my 3 seconds inch cut, and my 16th inch cut. In order to retain that same difference with every cut, it means I have to go back to that pin, which usually means I need to get a scrap piece of wood to make sure that my cut is exactly where I want it to be. If I want to get perfect cuts, I bypass the measuring strip altogether. Instead, I use either a tiny six inch ruler or a yardstick for larger sheets. Oh, and never a tape measure. I square up my measuring stick to the fence and find the point on my blade that juts out closest to the fence. If we're looking really closely at the blade, you can see that this points inward and this one points out this way. It's this tooth that I use to measure. Once I'm happy with the distance between the blade and the fence, I use my second trick. I'll now lock my fence and check my measurement again. If you think about what happens when you lock your fence, you're pulling the fence into a position where it is at a 90 degrees to the front of the saw. If there's any play in the fence, and again, these fences vary from one table saw to the next, you're just straightening it. Locking the fence doesn't necessarily throw it off, but it might. I taped a piece of paper to my saw and I'm gonna draw a line. Now I'll lock the fence and I'll draw another line. Now if I move the fence away, you can see that there's two lines at the beginning and it kind of merges down to one line. That means that my fence moved when I tightened it down. What I also like about using rulers from the fence is that I can add a sacrificial fence to my fence and I'm not so reliant on that tape, which would obviously be incorrect if I added a board to the side of my fence. When it comes time to push the stock through the blade, it's important to remember that you're not just pushing the wood forward, but that you're doing the best that you can to push it against the fence. Or in other words, you're creating a 45 degree angle of pressure. I like to think of it like a square. I'm putting just as much pressure this way as I am this way. It's for this reason that I made a push block that has a directional push to it. There's a pivot on the bottom of it that allows me to still grip the edge, but gives me the ability to direct the stock with that 45 degree angle of pressure I talked about earlier. Push sticks can achieve this same desired goal so long as you're using two of them. You might be asking at this point, how you can apply that type of pressure if you're cutting thinner stock. I mean, if I'm cutting an eighth inch strip from a piece of wood, how do I maintain that pressure against the fence? This is a huge problem with woodworking, and I'm sure it has created a number of close calls or even emergency room visits. In these type of circumstances, I'm faced with two different options. If the wood is shorter than about 12 inches, I have a push block with a rubbery base that I can sacrificially cut into. This puts pressure against the fence with a shorter length, and I'm better prepared to hold the stock in place as I cut it. What I like about my push block is that a bolt helps to stabilize the base with the thickness of the wood if the wood isn't wide. I can adjust it in such a way that I can keep it parallel to the face of the table saw, which further helps with accuracy and minimizes dangerous kickbacks. The downfall to this is that you do damage to the bottom of the rubber pad, which can be reapplied so long as you set your blade so that it only nicks the rubber. The second option, and the one that I tend to use more often, is my thin strip jig. As long as my stock is wide enough that I can use a push block or a push stick combo to maintain that 45 degrees of pressure, this jig is perfect. Normally when we rip things with a table saw, it's the wood between the fence and the blade that we're cutting for use. With a thin strip jig, we're more interested in the wood away from the fence and on the other side of our blade. I created this thin strip jig to be used where cutting would be dangerous to the table saw fence or our fingers. 
You'll first want to run your rough stock through the blade so that your stock is exactly parallel on each side. Then you'll set the thin strip jig to the thickness you're looking for and lock the jig into the miter slot. I lower the jig arm, press the fence against the stock, and slide both until they hit the jig. Now I'll slide out my stock and raise the arm. From here it's easy to keep that 45 degrees of pressure as I cut thinner stock and it's repeatable as I just need to press the stock against the arm, lock, and cut again. A final, more advanced user option that can come with a few sets of risks is the cut flip cut method. First and foremost, the stock you want to cut needs to be no shorter than about 20 inches due to safety reasons. I would definitely not want to cut this five inch strip of wood with this method as I would need to get my fingers half that distance or two and a half inches away from the blade. This would be dangerous and should never be done. But if the wood is 20 inches long or longer, we can cut a little more than halfway into the wood Stop the saw, lift, and flip, cutting the rest of the way on the opposite side. The only risk that you'll run into is keeping the second half of the flipped wood flat against the fence as pressing on the outside of the cut will cause the previously cut wood to be damaged. I had to stop here as I gave you a couple servings of word salad. So first, let's get rid of this. As soon as you make the first cut on the first half and then flip it over, if there's not enough space for you to press your wood against the fence with your fingers, you're on unstable, dangerous ground. You really need to be able to give that wood you flipped that same 45 degrees of pressure. In this circumstance, I would probably be okay. I can push the wood against the fence, but in a circumstance like this, where I've got a really thin piece of stock, it would be dangerous for me to try to hold onto this to slide it through the cut. There is a workaround. You can always add a piece of wood that's a little bit thicker than the kerf of the blade. And then as you cut, you can push against both pieces and be just fine. With the first three tools I mentioned in this video, I have complete step-by-step -step instructions on my website with separate videos that will walk you through the entire process. The website instructions, as well as the videos, are completely free and accessible right now. You can find the link in the description and I've made a playlist at the end of this video to watch all three videos to see for yourself if these tools are any interest to you. If you'd like to be a member of my Patreon and get bonus unpublished weekly videos along with a free all and access to my secret upcoming projects, as well as your name mentioned at the end of the videos, sign up for my Patreon. That link is in the description as well as at the end of each of all three tool builds on my website. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Tommy QR, and Zach Finch for their ongoing support. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, ring the bell, and I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob, and remember to keep making things.